Each year, Microsoft Research hosts hundreds of influential speakers from around the world, including leading scientists, renowned experts in technology, book authors, and leading academics, and makes videos of these lectures freely available. So uh, first, let me say thank you to several people. Um, before I get started, thank you to Sanjeev for the invitation. Um, uh, I immediately said yes uh, to this, given all of the, the great speakers that are speaking here today. And uh, as soon as I saw the email, I was on the phone to my dad, because uh, it's Father's Day this weekend in the United States. So I was like, oh, I'm sorry, I can't be there, because I have to be in Cambridge. Um, thank you to Microsoft Research. I'm a Microsoft faculty fellow. Uh, so this may be, uh, in part, a, a reconnaissance mission on their part. Where's all that money going? Uh, what are we spending it on? Uh, and thank you to my collaborators. Uh, on the first paper, Lev Muchnik, uh, who's a research scientist with me, a, a postdoc at NYU, and Arun Sundararajan, who's a colleague of mine uh, at NYU. And on the second two papers, Dylan Walker, who's a, uh, another postdoctoral research scientist uh, with me at NYU. So to so all the Microsoft uh, people in the room, that's where your money is going, uh, to those postdocs. Um, so what I want to talk about today is uh, social contagion in networks and peer-to-peer -peer influence in networks and in particular uh, identification. So trying to make causal statistical uh, estimation of when a peer is influencing another peer in a network to do anything from buy a product or vote for a different political candidate or take on a new health behavior. Uh, and mostly what I'm going to talk about today is in the context of business, but as you'll see, uh, the basic idea can apply to many different things. So uh, I have a program of research, one of maybe two uh, programs of research, to basically mine massive social network data uh, to better understand how behavioral contagions spread in a social network. And as you can imagine, this builds up from, uh, from first principles about how one individual individual influences another to do something, and how do you estimate statistically in observational data or experimental data whether that is going on, and there's a lot of complications to that, which I want to sort of talk about today, and as you can imagine, this has a lot of different applications. It can be applied to product adoption and demand uh, estimation, it can be applied to peer-to-peer -peer and viral marketing, it can, I've applied it to the productivity of information workers, but it also applies to a lot of other social uh, aspects like uh, disease prevention, how do you spread condom use behavior uh, in, in a population, or uh, HIV testing, et cetera. Okay, so you can sort of think broadly about what this could be applied to. Um, and I want to encourage you not only to sort of ask questions throughout the talk, but also to feel free to laugh uh, during the talk. It's okay, you can laugh with me, you can laugh at me, either one is okay, because we know that laughter is correlated with satisfaction, and so I certainly want you to get the most out of this. Um, so I have this cartoon on my door in my office, um, and people who have actually been to my office know that I, I actually have this cartoon on my door at my office, and it's two friends talking, and one friend says to the other, I used to think correlation implied causation, then I took a statistics class and now I don't, and the friend says it sounds like the class helped, and the guy goes, well, maybe. And the idea is that, well, maybe this guy has a proclivity to understand statistics and so selected into the class, or maybe there's some confounding factor that makes him more likely to understand statistics and uh, have, have access to this class or, or want to go to this class. And so he learns that maybe correlation is not causation, that we need to separate these, right? So. Um, this is a notorious problem in, in networks, obviously. There's the reflection problem, but there's also sort of classical endogeneity. And the basic idea here is that identifying causal peer effects in networks is notoriously difficult. By now, we have lots of empirical evidence that behaviors amongst linked nodes uh, in networks tend to cluster in network space and in time. Uh, but is this because of peer influence or some alternative explanations? And a lot of this stream of research is about separating uh, peer effects from other things. And I want to go to an example that was mentioned earlier on in the day, which is uh, this uh, obesity study by Christakis and Fowler, uh, which got a lot of press when it first came out and is now starting to get a lot of press again, maybe for different reasons. Um, this uh, study is actually a really good study which shows that uh, body mass index increases are correlated amongst friends over time. That's what it shows, okay? But, uh, you know, for whatever reason, um, the 
collective unconscious and the media uh, took hold of this result and they started writing articles like this. Are your friends making you fat? Okay, which is a very causal statement. Um, and as you'll see, I think that the reason why this is important is because uh, whether or not obese body mass index increases are correlated amongst friends over time is the result, or whether your friends are making you fat is the result, has direct and meaningful implications for policy, like how should the NIH spend its $1 billion stimulus funding? Should it be on peer-to-peer -peer obesity prevention methods, or should it be on some other type of obesity prevention method? Okay? So another explanation for this result is homophily, right? Birds of a feather tend to flock together. We tend to choose friends who are like ourselves, and so the marathon runners are friends with the marathon runners, and the people who like to eat at the all-you-can-eat buffet line at Denny's are friends with each other. And so you get to this pockets of obesity and pockets of non-obesity. And yes, this can even occur over time in a panel data set of changes in body mass index over time. And this is not new. I mean, we knew this before 2000. 2008. This quote was originally attributed to Robert Burton in the 1500s, but it's even older than that because before Robert Burton it was Aristotle who was saying that people love those who are like themselves, and, and before Aristotle it was Plato who said similarity begets friendship. And just to prove to you that a long line of worthy scholars have made this argument, it was my mom who said hanging out with a bad crowd will get you into trouble, and she was really not too pleased when at the dinner table I told her that she might have gotten the causal structure of that argument wrong. Uh, she wasn't very happy with that. Um, so uh, Slate ran an article which was titled Everything is Contagious, which ironically was about the contagion amongst academics to publish studies about contagion. So it's not just obesity. Uh, apparently happiness is contagious and product adoption is contagious and cooperation is contagious and loneliness is contagious which is the one that I understand the least of those, I think. But the, the thing that I'm trying to get at here is that it might be contagion, but there are also lots of alternative explanations for this. So the reflection problem is really about separating individual outcomes from group means, but then you also have homophily. What is the selection of friendship process, and does you know, our characteristics play into that? And there's also confounding. Maybe two linked nodes are more likely to be exposed to the same external stimuli, like maybe we work in the same office and the office gives me an incentive to go to the gym or maybe my bonus is based or maybe I get subsidies to go to the gym or maybe a restaurant opens up in our local network uh, in our local neighborhood and we make friends with people who are local to us uh, in geographic space etc so the reason separating these things is so important is because the causal structure of the underlying dynamic process implies different diffusion properties for the behavior where is it going to go next so who should we target if we want to promote or contain the behavior and also different optimal containment and promotion policies. So the example that I like to give is that if I gave you a network and I said that there's a large correlation, a big correlation in this behavior over time amongst friends, whatever it is, smoking, condom use, product adoption, and I said in scenario A, 90% of that correlation can be explained by peer influence, a peer is influencing their friends to do the behavior and 10% is due to homophily. But in scenario B, it was the opposite, that 90% was due to homophily and 10% was due to peer influence, then in the first scenario, you'd probably want to take some sort of a peer-to-peer -peer strategy to maybe give incentives to someone to get their friends to, to take on the behavior. And in the second, you might want to segment the population based on observable demographic characteristics because those are the ones that are really driving the movement of the behavior through the population. And then you'd want to target people that are either at risk or likely to be have their behavior behavior changed, et cetera, okay? So uh, there is some theory and literature about how we might achieve causal statistical estimation in this, in this sort of uh, setting. Uh, there are some peer effects models, which are ex essentially extended spatial autoregressive models. A lot of these uh, are sort of originating loosely from the original Frank and Strauss uh, in 86 paper. Most of them are focused on the reflection problem, uh, trying to separate individual outcomes from group means, but they generally use variation in group size or structure as some sort of an instrumental variable uh, to identify deviations from group means. There's Tom Snyder's work uh, um, at Oxford about the co-evolution co of networks and behavior, and basically uh, this work models micro decisions where actors simultaneously maximize some network 
network utility function and some behavioral utility function, and then they apply uh, continuous time Markov models to panel data, which they estimate with Markov chain Monte Carlo or other simulated method of moments uh, um, techniques. Uh, one of the issues with this is that it sort of doesn't uh, work well with large networks uh, because it's difficult for, uh, it's, it doesn't converge if you have a large network typically with these kinds of methods. Uh, there are some papers that use natural experiments like the Dartmouth roommate study or instrumental variables. So Catherine Tucker has this paper where she's looking at trying to understand peer effects in the adoption of a video conferencing technology. And she uses the World Cup as an instrument. She says that people in the UK are more interested in streaming World Cup games live during the World Cup. And so during the World Cup, there's this exogenous boost to their utility from having a video streaming technology. And she says that but Americans are less interested in the World Cup, and so if an American has a friend in the UK who has this exogenous boost to their utility from video conferencing, then I can identify the effect of the increased use by Americans who have friends in the UK versus those that don't. But sort of the problem there is that the person in the US that has a friend in the UK isn't like the average person in the US. They're more similar to the people in the UK than uh, people in the US on average are, and so they're more likely to like soccer, and so is this instrument exogenous or not? There's a lot of uh, different questions there. You can uh, achieve identification, sort of mathematical identification, if you have a structural model where you make some assumptions about the distributions of priors and things like that. Yes. Uh, yes, but I mean, these are specifically, all of these are applied specifically to networks. Okay, yes. The, the problems that, 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 that you have in network are not very different. Uh, uh, yes. What, what are the differences? Well, let me sort of hold off on that and maybe talk about that uh, over coffee. There are some specific uh, difficulties in understanding this in networks because you have so many individual decisions and assortativity has a particular influence on individuals that are either surrounded by similar or non-similar types. But in general, the identification problem is a much larger problem uh, when you're trying to, to, to get some causal statistical estimations. Let me hold off on that and maybe we can take it offline. Yes. Solutions, yes. Yes. So if you have certain characteristics of the structure, you can use that as an instrument uh, to solve parts yeah. of the problem, not all of the problem, but yes. Uh, and some parts of this endogeneity problem are harder than others. Uh, as we were talking at the break, I find the most difficult uh, scenario for me is trying to estimate networks and performance inside closed organizations where the networks are very dense and where exogenous things that don't affect both performance and the network are very difficult to find, et cetera. Bernie? Uh, this is about, most of this, except with the exception of this, is about outcomes of nodes as a function of... Yes, but... but yes, yes. So if you're making that distinction, yes. The only point I was making was that this also models the friendship formation process. <coughs> okay, so... Uh, as this is just the literature review before I get to the meat of it, let me just sort of uh, describe this point five. We published a paper in the Proceedings of the National Academy of Sciences in 2009, which tried to add to this literature a little bit uh, uh, with a technique uh, based on match sampling, which we just sort of adapted to the network context. Um, and there we had the, the basic approach was to take as a treatment those people with N friends who'd adopted the product uh, at or before time t, and then as a control, uh, those or, or a control group or a match sample group, those that are as likely to have n friends as the treated, but who don't. So first, we build a predictive model of having friends who have adopted the behavior, and then we matched individuals based on their likelihoods of having friends, and then we compared the adoption rates of match sample individuals, and we did it dynamically over time. OK, 
Okay. And so uh, what I want to talk a little bit about, I want to give you two slides on this just to show you what the results of this paper were, and then I want to spend the rest of the time uh, on what I'm spending 90% of my time on now, which is randomized experiments in real large social networks in the real world. Um, and I want to describe a couple of those. Uh, there have been some other uh, randomized trials of peer effects in the past, like Esther DeFlo uh, has done a paper with uh, uh, Saez about uh, with, where there's an intention to treat the um, individuals in an organization to give them access to uh, promotions for investment counseling and then observing the rate of investment by their people in their department to see if there's a spillover effect. And Marcus Mobius at Harvard has done some work with colleagues about experiments in Facebook about altruism and reciprocity. And we're following sort of in that line, but we're doing it at the scale of millions of people at a time on Facebook, okay? So um, in the first study, uh, which was the Proceedings of the National Academy paper. Um, we studied a network of 30 million people interacting daily on Yahoo Instant Messenger. So we had data from Yahoo on 30 million people sending instant messages to each other day by day for about six months. We also had detailed demographic and geographic behavior about these individuals. Uh, and we had comprehensive and detailed and precise data about their online behaviors and activities, which means to say that we observed their page views on Yahoo. So we could see whether somebody was looking at a lot of finance or sports, et cetera. And this was part of what we used to train our models of the likelihood of friendship formation between two people, uh, which was you know, about homophily. So do we like the same type of things, et cetera. And then we also had the day-by-day -day adoption and usage of a mobile service product called Yahoo Go, which was launched in July 2007. There are about half a million adopters. And this is the adoption curve uh, of that product. So our goal was to try and understand uh, estimate, estimate what the likely impact of having a friend or two friends or three friends that have adopted this product on your product adoption likelihood trying to control for correlated preferences by this match sample, this dynamic match sample uh, process. Okay? And I won't go too much into it since I don't want to focus on that today. I just want to describe the main results. So if we used uh, the traditional methodology, which is sort of like a logit with some control variables on your likelihood of adoption given how many friends you adopted, this is what we would find. So this is for one, two, three, four additional friends who've adopted the behavior. So what this node tells you is that in the first two weeks, the first time we measured it, we measured it sort of every two weeks um, after launch, you're nine times more likely to adopt the product if you have one friend who's adopted the product, okay? you are seven times more likely in the next uh, period to adopt the product if you have one friend who's adopted the product, et cetera. So these are the estimates of influence that we get with a traditional method. And then if we do the match sample uh, framework over time, these are the estimates that we get. So the conclusion is that much of the estimated influence is really just observable homophily. And if I match people based on uh, correlated preferences and then take uh, just the difference to people that have the same level of correlated preferences with somebody who's adopted the product, but one person has a friend and the other person doesn't, what is the additional influence? And this is what we get. I don't want to focus too much on this paper, but two things to notice is that the first there is a, a, a significant chance of overestimation of peer influence if you attribute it all to peer influence and don't do something uh, to control for homophily or correlated preferences. The second is that there's this uh, sort of miscalculation in the timing. There's this notion that uh, there's a lot of peer influence in the beginning of the product life cycle and less so in the end, where it looks pretty constant over time uh, when you do the dynamic match sample estimation. And the reason for that is because uh, there's exaggerated homophily amongst early adopters. So uh, if you take the cosine similarity of the individuals based on all of their uh, geographic, demographic, and browsing behavior data, uh, you see that Early on, adopters, which are these hollow circles, are much more like their other adopter friends, which are these hollow, hollow circles, than their non-adopter friends or a randomly selected user. And over time, uh, this 
uh, this exaggerated homophily disappears, okay? And you can think about it like this. People that are standing in line, uh, two friends who are standing in line waiting to get the iPad are much more similar to each other in terms of their preferences than two friends who buy the iPad six months after it's been released, okay? So there's a much greater homophily between people who adopt the product early than there is uh, later on. And that's what causes this greater overestimation of peer influence at the beginning of the product's life cycle than at the end, okay? So that study was okay, it had, it had some benefits. Number one, it does better with more data, whereas some of the other methods that we describe do worse with more data. The, be the better and the more comprehensive the data, the better the matches, and so the better the estimates. But um, it also has some limitations. Uh, we're limited to what we can observe, so there might be unobserved heterogeneity that drives uh, homophily. Um, and also, it's still an observational study, right? So there's, there's a lot of things that could be going on. So in the next study, what we tried to do is overcome two limitations of that previous study. The first is that this is still observational, and really the holy grail of this is to do a randomized experiment to try and, and find peer influence. And the second is that the other uh, study just looks at a product that was launched and sees how it was adopted in a network, but uh, more and more people are asking, well, how can we make a product spread, like with viral marketing? So in this uh, paper, what we ask is, can we engineer a product so that it's more likely to go viral? So what we do, uh, and we call this viral product design, and we define that very basically as the process of explicitly engineering products so they're more likely to be shared amongst friends, okay? And we sort of discuss in the paper that there could be two dimensions to this, the characteristics of the product, which you can think of like if it's a video, what is the guy doing? If you dance funny, is that more viral? Or if you make people laugh, is that more viral? Or if you wear uh, you know, loud colors, is that more viral? Those are sort of the characteristics. And what we focus on this paper is uh, features. Okay, so characteristics have been studied, not that much. There are a handful of papers about it, um, but there are some content that is more likely to inspire viral sharing. Usefulness, topicality, prominence, positive valence, unexpectedness. There's a paper in this group here, uh, I think it's uh, Berger and Heath, that shows that the urban legends that are most likely to spread are the ones that are gross and disgusting, um, which says something about our society. Um, but what we focus on is viral product features, and what that means to us is modalities of use with respect to how you interact with your friends or share with your friends. For instance, the ability to invite your friends to the product would be a feature that you could add to a product that might uh, help it spread amongst your friends. Another one is notifications. So as I do something with the product, it automatically tells my friends, hey, you know, if I'm on Netflix and other friends of mine are on Netflix, if I got a notification email that said, oh, Sinon just rated Terminator 2 a three out of five. That would remind me that Sinon is on Netflix, you might be interested in Netflix, et cetera, if you weren't uh, a Netflix user. Um, and hypertext embedding uh, is another one. Um, so for instance, there's uh, a product made by slide.com that you can embed on your website, a rotating set of your own pictures. And if you click on that, it takes you to slide and allows you to download the application yourself. So if I'm your friend and I'm visiting your website often, I might see that and click on it and adopt the product, it might make it easier for you to sort of, uh, in a passive way, share the product with me, make me more likely to adopt it and give me a path towards product adoption. One of the first viral features that I can really think of was Hotmail, right? 1996, this was a long time ago. When Hotmail was introduced, every email at the bottom said, get your free Hotmail at www.hotmail.com. That is a viral feature in my definition. It is an advertisement for a product and a link to product, uh, a path to product adoption. I click the link and I adopt the product. The product is the same. The only difference is that they added this feature which advertises the product amongst friends and allows you to passively share a path to product adoption with friends. So in the paper, we more formally, but in a presentation a little bit more graphically here, describe two basic hypotheses, um, and we do this along two continuum. Uh, the degree to which the personalization of the feature is increasing and the degree to which the activity required by the initial adopter user is increasing. So uh, 
Think of personalized referrals as I write in somebody's email and I send them a message that says, hey, Sanjeev, you would really like this application because I know you're interested in networks and it's a game about networks and here's a path to product adoption. Uh, and I choose the people in my network to who, who to send that message to. Okay? That is a personalized referral in our, in our sort of world. And down here, think about an automated broadcast notification. As I uh, do things with the product, it just passively sends notifications to my friends saying, Sinan did this with the product today. Uh, people who haven't adopted the product or, or have adopted the product. And you can imagine what we're going to do is we're going to do this experiment in Facebook. So I have a bunch of friends in Facebook. I adopt an application. As I use it, it's sending passive messages. Or I have the option to click Invite, write in the names and email addresses of the people I want to invite, and hit Send with a personalized message. That's sort of the feature. And what we hypothesize is that moving up this gradient uh, you're going to get greater marginal peer influence per message for many reasons. Because I'm going to select people who I think are interested in the product. That's part of the reason. It's going to be more persuasive because it's a personal message from somebody they know, etc. Moving in the opposite direction, however, you're going to generate more messages. Why? Because it's costly in time and energy for me to sit there and invite all my friends. Right? Also, it might be a social cost. My friends might not, getting, might not like getting spam emails from me about, about products, and so I may be more reluctant to send those messages. So what this does is it sort of sets up a, an empirical question. Well, which is more effective? Well, uh, this might be more effective because more messages are sent. The other might be more effective because uh, each message will be more persuasive. Okay? So here's the setup of the, of the paper. We took an application. And as people adopted this application, we divided them randomly into control and experimental group users. So for the experimental group users, we randomly enabled some of these viral features. Okay? So this is an experimental group user who has three friends, and the lines are solid because those viral feature channels are turned on. This is a control group user who also has three friends, and the lines are dashed simply because those viral channels are turned off. Okay? And then we observe the adoption and usage behavior of the application by friends of the control and experimental group. Okay? Is that clear? So we had 10,000 experimental users. Those are the initial adopters of the product that were uh, assigned to different treatments. And then those 10,000 uh, people had 1.4 million friends. Okay? And we observed two things. We observed the adoption behavior of the product by friends and also the use. Do they actually use the product? Do they hit the server every day doing things on the product or not? Okay. And we think both are important, and you'll see why in a minute. So just to, just to be crystal clear, we have this uh, multiple experimental versions of this Facebook application. By the way, I think Facebook is a really nice platform to do these kinds of experimental studies because it's not sort of an artificial environment. This is what people do to adopt products on Facebook every day. And these are multi-billion dollar businesses like Zenga are built on products like this where you are sharing sheep and, and things like that on, on a farm. Okay, so this is, this is big business and it's real behavior. Um, and you can also get many experimental users cheaply. Each recruited user cost us 62 cents in this uh, study. Um, of the, the initial 10,000 cost us 62 cents because we needed to advertise the, the product to get people to adopt it. Um, so as users adopt the application, we randomly assign them to control and experimental groups. So this blue guy would be experimental and this guy would be control. And then we collected data on their personal attributes and preferences from their Facebook profiles, as well as data on their social networks and the personal attributes and preferences of their network neighbors. So we have this control group, we have this experimental group, and in the experimental group, viral messaging is enabled. Um, and, in the, and so experimental users send invitations and notifications to their neighbors. And in the control group, viral messaging <laughs> is disabled. We also have a second experiment where we randomized receipt of the passive messages, which I'll describe one result from at the end. So only a randomly selected subset of the neighbors receive the passive messages. And the reason that's important is because it gives us a second randomized experiment on susceptibility to influence. Because now the indivi individual isn't getting to choose which other friends the message goes to, but those are randomly selected. And then on expectation,
expectation, a recipient and a non-recipient of the message are the same on expectation along dimensions of likelihood of product adoption, demographic characteristics, et cetera, okay? Then we compare the click-through adoption and usage data of the neighbors of experimental and control group users, and this allows us to test uh, two things. The average treatment effect of viral messaging capabilities, turning these capabilities or features on and off, on peer adoption and network propagation, and the second experiment gives us these randomized uh, trials of susceptibility to peer influence via viral messaging. Yes, the application is free, which we discuss at length in the paper. Uh, you might expect that uh, different things happen uh, when, you, when you think about a costly application, although it's non-trivial to think about what those implications might be. Um, and I'm going to describe the application to you in detail in a second. So if, if you have questions about what is this application, uh, hold on for one second. Did the participants know you were in your ex in, in an experiment? Mm -mm. Participants don't know that they are in an experiment. They still give informed consent, though, insofar as they approve through the app. Yes, so in the app, they, I mean, no, so, so let me just be clear. This is an experiment that is conducted by a firm, uh, like Google is running any number of 1,200 experiments daily on their users who see different search results and then they're testing which, which algorithms are working better or worse. And then they're giving us the data and we're analyzing the data. So we are not recruiting the, the, experiment, the users, we are not uh, bringing them into our lab. This is on Facebook going on in their normal everyday use. So, um, and what we, by the way, in terms of informed consent and all that, what we receive is a de-identified data set of the outcomes of an experiment that a firm ran, okay? So the application is a competitor to Flickster. It is a commercial grade application uh, uh, developed for a competitor to Flickster. It is a movie application where you can go read about movies, buy tickets, rate movies, friend celebrities, read about actors, directors, etc. It's very robust. Um, and so it has all of these different types of features like you see here, which is uh, Flickster. Um, and so in this application, you have the ability to invite your friends to the application. This is the invite feature where you can, in various places on the application, click on the invite feature and be able to invite your friends. If you click on this, you are taken to a page that looks like this where you can find your friends, you can scroll through them, you can type in their email address, you can then type a personal note and hit send, and that will send invitation messages with a link to product adoption into the email inbox on Facebook of the people you select to send the message to, okay? Um, there's also notifications where as you use the application, it says, you know, Sinon has just rated Terminator 2 on this application, and it's going through your stream of things that are going on in your network. And there's a link there that you can click on to adopt the application, okay? And those are randomly sent. If you click on either link, the one in the email or the one in the notification, you're taken to an application canvas page which provides you information about the application and you're, you have the ability to adopt the application there. Okay? So we have this baseline group, this passive broadcast group which are the notifications, and this active personalized group which are the invitations. Okay? Uh, and then we want to look at the behavior of the friends of these different experimental groups. Okay? So one thing that immediately becomes apparent when you look at this graph and you think about experiments and networks is that there could be contamination and leakage of the different experimental conditions because lots of people are connected in this network. Um, so you could be connected through indirect pathways, you could be connected to multiple treated peers in different treatment groups or in the same treatment group. So you could have a friend with one friend in treatment one, one friend in treatment two, you could have a f uh, somebody with multiple friends in a given treatment group, etc. So the first thing I want to note is that these scenarios are relatively rare in our data. They don't affect our results all that much, but we take a very conservative approach here. We control for leakage and peers of multiple treated users by only evaluating uh, recruited users and right censoring contaminated peers. And here's how we define contamination. Uh, a contaminated peer is any peer with multiple treated peers after the time at which they have multiple treated peers. So, for example, if this is the original recruited user and these are the adoption times, T0, T1, and T2, here's the first friend who adopts and the second, 
this person is contaminated immediate at time uh, one and after. Okay? So they're part of the experiment until they adopt. But at this point, this person has two uh, friends who've adopted the application, and we uh, censor that individual. Here you have the same situation, but there's no link between these two, so uh, two is a valid observation throughout the experiment. Now, this makes our results slightly more conservative, but prevents uh, any bias because of contamination and leakage. Okay? So one first thing to show you is that randomization works. On expectation, these people are no different on anything that we observe about them. Um, but when you look at adoption, uh, it differs significantly across these groups, right? So the number of adopters in users' local networks or the percentage of your friends who adopt after you've adopted and even maximal diffusion depth are all statistically significantly different for baseline passive and active users. So uh, passive users have a 7x increase in the number of adopters in their local networks and active users have a 10x increase. What I should say is that the active group has both the notifications and the invitations, so it's sort of additive. Uh, and then uh, the passive group just has the notifications and the baseline has neither. And we've, in the paper we detail you know, the degree to which these may be uh, complementary uh, in terms of their effect on peer adoption. And we find that they're not really. And so we can sort of compare <clears throat> invitations and notifications to each other. Sure. Yes. So what we did was uh, we uh, paid for an advertising campaign which was designed to recruit a population representative of the Facebook population. And then in the paper we show the, the characteristics of the study population and the Facebook population and we test to see whether they're different. It's non-trivial because we're working on very noisy data from Facebook about their population. We have good statistics on our population but they look very good. <laughs> Everything that we can observe, activity, wall posts, age, gender, et cetera, whatever we could see and measure, all of those things. That's all in a long appendix about, the, about whether the, the sample population is, is representative. Yeah, because that's very important, Yes. Yes, yes. So you want to make sure that you have a, a distribution of activity that looks like what you would see on Facebook. So now I don't recall hearing this in the paper, but what about the, the algorithm for the wall feed having a uh, multiple effect on the active group? Yes, so I'm going to talk about that. We, in, our, in our study of use, we control for that specifically. Oh, okay. Yeah. <laughs> and we have to control for that, for the reason that you're thinking about. Okay, so these are very basic sort of results just looking at differences in means. But if you think about how contagion is measured in traditional studies, it's usually some sort of a function like this where the likelihood of adoption or the rate of adoption uh, conditional on not having adopted before is some function of your characteristics and some social parameter, which is the uh, adoption behavior or the characteristics of your friends and some adjacency matrix. Okay? Um, but this is really difficult to estimate in an experimental way because if I was to do this in an experiment, I would have to control the friends of every observation in my study, which on Facebook, as we've seen, is between you know, 0 and 5,000 with an average of 120 or however many it was. And so for every observation, I would have to experimentally control all of the adoptions of their friends, which becomes untenable. So the conventional approach is to estimate from outside in the effects of your friends on your likelihood of adoption. But what we do is we treat the person in the middle and then we try to estimate the effects on the adoption outside, which creates at least two challenges, which we discuss in the paper. The first is that it's unlikely that uh, the baseline hazard of the first adoption is the same as the second or the third or the fourth. And it's likely that the adoption uh, probabilities or the outcomes of those nodes are correlated, they're not independent. Yes? Yes, okay. So uh, 
just to quickly then say that we correct for both of these things. We use a variance corrected stratified proportional hazards model, which takes into consideration the uh, variance and covariance of outcomes of linked nodes and also separately estimates a baseline hazard for the first adopter, the second adopter, the third adopter, et cetera. Because these processes are probably nonlinear. The, the hazard of the second adopter is probably uh, higher than the first, and it's probably increasing. And when you plot it, it is. It looks roughly power or exponential. So what are the results? Well, uh, as you might expect, the personal invitations are more persuasive. Okay, so every so uh, the beta on invitations is six percent, which means there's a six percent increase in the hazard of adoption in your local network stratified across first, second, and third adopters on average per invitation sent, and a two percent increase per notification sent. Okay, so what this begins to tell you is that well, in invitations look like the way to go. They're more persuasive. Right. But when you look at global diffusion, personal invitations nearly double uh, the contagion in the network, uh, but it's actually passive awareness that has a much bigger effect. And the reason is because there are more messages being sent. Even though each message is less persuasive, there are many more messages and so more total adoptions created by the passive awareness feature. Um, and then what we wanted to look at is use, the stickiness of the application. Do people continue to use it? So let me show you three graphs. These graphs just corroborate the results that I told you. This is uh, the cumulative number of peer adopters over time for the active, passive, and baseline, the susceptible peer adoption fraction over time for active, passive, and baseline, and the survival estimates for baseline, passive, and active. Okay? What this result shows you is use of the application by the original adopter as a function of the number of their friends who've adopted the application over time. This is, uh, sorry, not as a function of the number of friends who've adopted the application, that comes next. This is uh, just the use of the application by active, passive, and baseline users over time since their adoption. And what it shows is that these people who on expectation are no different from one another. The only difference is we gave one person an application with the ability to invite their friends and another person doesn't have that ability. The person that has the ability to invite their friends uses the application way more and sustainably more than the other people. And passive more than baseline, but after 30 days it's indistinguishable. So when you see this result, the first thing that you think to yourself is there's some sort of network externality going on. When I invite my friends and they join me on the application, I'm more likely to stick with it. As I see my friends rating movies, I'm more interested in rating movies and being part of the application, et cetera. Okay? But there are a lot of alternative explanations we have to rule out if we want to stick by that network externality story. So, what we see is we're doing here a regression on application activity as a function of you know, this, whether you have a passive or active version and the held out is the baseline, your degree, your Facebook activity, your uh, application, the activity you have on the application, the uh, number of notifications you've sent, the number of invites you've sent, and the number of adopters. So the viral state is correlated with application activity. That basically shows you the result I just showed you in the graph. If I give you the active version, you're more likely to use it more often. Okay? Uh, however, when I control for the number of your friends upon receiving a notification or invitation that join the application, that result goes away and almost uh, all of the sort of uh, estimate that is estimated with any precision is from the number of friends that you have gotten to adopt the application. So you make invites. The more of them that join, the more likely you are to increase your use of the application. So this is beginning to tell a network externality story. But there could be alternative explanations like, for instance, uh, sending notifications is correlated with my extra activity. As I send notifications or invites, I'm hitting the server, so that's going to register as activity. And people who are using the invitation feature are just more active in general. And so it's not the friends coming, but it's the use of the uh, thing that, that, that creates it. But when you control for both of those, the number of notifications and invites you send, uh, peer adoption is still a significant driver of your use of the application. Okay, And I'm going to skip quickly over the next two slides, what we do in the paper is we thoroughly go through all of the possible alternative explanations to network externalities, including 
demand effects, the existence of the features is what really makes you interested in the product and other types of things, okay? And these are all of the possible explanations for the result we see and we can systematically one by one rule all of those out. And everything that we're left with suggests that network externalities are driving use of the product, okay? And so what we see is that it's the, the personal invitations that drive stickiness. So as you saw, after 30 days, passive didn't look anything different than baseline. And the reason for that is because if I choose to invite certain people, it's those people that are going to keep me with the product, not just any random person in my network that has that uh, network effect on me. Okay? Uh, what this creates is sort of a virtuous cycle of peer adoption and use. So as I invite more people, as I add features to the product, more of my friends join. As more of my friends join, I'm less likely to churn away from the product. As I use the product more, I'm generating more notifications, et cetera, et cetera, okay, with probably some diminishing returns as well. Um, we show in the paper that this is more effective than uh, traditional email campaigns, Facebook banner ads, or web banner ads. Um, and I'll leave you this one final result, which is the last slide. Uh, and this is a teaser for the second paper that we're writing, which is about the randomized experiment on susceptibility to influence. Okay, so what we can ask in that study is, we randomly send messages, and then we can say, well, who's more susceptible to a message from a random uh, friend? Is it men? Is it women? Or do women influence men more? Or do men influence women more? Et cetera, et cetera. So one result that, uh, that we have is this uh, one that we're still kicking the tires on this. So I just want to sort of give you a preview of it. And it's about your relationship status on Facebook, whether you're single, in a relationship, engaged, married, or it's complicated. So if you're single, you are uh, more uh, susceptible to influence than if you don't report your relationship status. If you're in a relationship, you're even more susceptible to influence than if you're single. If you're engaged, you're even more susceptible to influence than if you're in a relationship. And if you're married, you're not susceptible at all to peer influence, apparently. And if it's complicated, you're the most susceptible, most likely to respond positively to a random uh, message. Okay. And we, we have debated why this result exists, and we actually have some competing stories about it, so I'm happy to talk about it over coffee. Perfect. Okay. Thanks. 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 Thanks.